Welcome to Psychological Explorations with Dr. Michael Axelman and Daniela. Today we present our approach to limit setting for parents and teachers. So we begin with the idea that there are limit seekers and limit setters. And children and adolescents at particular phases of development are compelled to seek limits, to test boundaries. Winnicott put it as follows in his classic paper, a, a tremendous contribution to object relations theory the use of an object and relating through identifications. At the point of development that is under survey, the child is creating the parent in the sense of finding externality itself. And it has to be added that this experience depends on the parent's capacity to survive. It is important that survive in this context means not retaliate. This destructive activity is the child's attempt to place the parent outside the area of omnipotent control. That is out in the world, something that's real outside of the child. And as we move forward with this presentation, this important point that finding the limits to one's omnipotence is an essential feature in development more generally. The parent's goal is to provide that amount of environmental stability capable of withstanding the strain resulting from the child seeking the limits of their omnipotent influence. The child's realization that their omnipotent wishes have limits in the real world provides internal relief from the compulsion of testing and retesting the sturdiness of the parental environment again and again. So you can see here how developmentally important it is for the child to find out that there's forces that exist that are greater than them, more powerful than them. And they must learn to work with, to collaborate with these as features in the real world. Otherwise, they're stuck in object relating right, relating through identifications where they project an aspect of themselves into other people. And these people are viewed as being solely in the service of them, right, this one-sided relationship. Let's go now to discussing the technique of limit setting. We begin with value clarification. And limit setting on the part of parents is the active expression of their commitment to their values and ideals. So the, the generic categories that it seems like most all parents will agree with are respect, and safety, that they don't want their children in the home or students in the classroom acting in a disrespectful way or in a way that might be unsafe, right? Both of these seem to require limit setting. And if parents don't have a clear set of values that emerge, um, it's a good place to start with respect and safety. Many times there's family and cultural values, 
whether it's uh, attending a religious service once a week, attending a family meal, visiting with a grandparent, where the expectation is that we're going to do this regularly and we'd like you to be involved and participate in a respectful way. So the first step with parents is clarifying values and having the parents agree upon rules and consequences. These values then get expressed to the child and communicated so the child understands that these are important values to us, not destroying property, not hurting other people, staying safe, having everybody in the family stay safe, and then communicate to the child the, the system that is going to be put into place with respect to limit setting and consequences. The second step, right, is this verbal warnings. So we've communicated expectations and consequences clearly and consistently now to the child. They understand that there's new rules in place and a new system. And when there's a violation of the, the family rules and values, this will be communicated to the child directly with the parent speaking clearly and giving a verbal warning. Provide warnings that are communicated consistently with the right attitude and expression. It's really helpful for parents and teachers to keep any agitation or feelings of disruption that's coming up internally from being expressed calmly, clearly. And the parent is projecting that they really don't care too much if the child keeps taking this further. It's just something they're prepared to do calmly and firmly. Thirdly, the parent remains calm, firm, and consistent. And there can be one, two, or even three warnings. But certainly by the fourth, and, and some families decide that one warning is adequate, and they go right to the final request in the second warning. And that makes sense to me, too. Yet yeah, children are not having a knowledge gap when they get to this point in limit testing and limit seeking. They really want to go through the experience and have the consequence. Um, they're compelled to do that to find the outcome. So the parent will give the final request. If you do or do not say put on your pajamas get ready for bath get in the bath um, then you're going to be on a timeout and some parents prefer a time in where the parent and the child are together going through the timeout it doesn't really matter as long as there's a timeout there's some experience on the part of the child that they have to submit to this process called time out, time in, time on the stoop, whatever you want to call this time. The note here for parents is do not ever make a final request unless you are prepared to move into action orientation and follow through with agreed upon consequences. And if you're stuck there, that would be a great time to ask for some consultation from a parent specialist, a parent educator, a therapist, psychologist to help you implement uh, limits that are more effective in the house. 
So action oriented. Linking the final limit violation with stated consequences. Okay, this is when we go from verbal to action, establishing consequences as the end result of limit setting. Once again, the attitude is firmness, calmness. And parents decide in advance if it's a time out or a time in, one minute per year seems to me to be very effective. So a three-year-old would have three minutes, a five-year-old five minutes. But if a six-year-old has three minutes, it's equally effective. Um, it's typically not the length of the time on the timeout. It's the fact that the child is having a consequence that they have to experience. So it's very relieving at this time for a child to have that experience who is testing and retesting that each time they do this, the same thing happens. And the parent can reiterate that every time you do this, we're going to put you on the timeout until you learn how to control yourself and no longer do this. So the plant, parent will plant that seed that the child will develop these internal controls. And until that time, the, the parents will provide this external structure. So some of the, the mistakes with technique, the soft touch parents in our model, okay, those who are tend to be more supportive and tolerant more focused on praising their child and they struggle with discipline, these parents tend to accent passivity over activity and accent tolerance and compromise over that firm and clear limit that's non-negotiable. So during this process, parents are limiting their talk. There's no negotiation. It's action oriented and it's not up for discussion. So the parents can't entertain when the child brings them into some debate about some small part with respect to why they're on the consequence. Guilt often gets in the way. Parents are struggling with a generalized or specified sense of guilt Perhaps they're working all day and they get home at six o'clock and they want the last two hours of the day with their child to go very well. And in this way, they may accommodate and say yes at the very times that it's critically important to set the limit and say no and show the child that they don't have the power to influence the adults in the house with their mood, with their attitude, with their behavior. Parents are calmer, stronger, kinder than the child. Many times these soft touch parents are taking anger and frustration and turning it inward. Firm edge parents tend to do the opposite. Okay, their struggles are they're setting limits reactively rather than calmly. The child externalizes their internal tension state and acting with, okay, this is the parental tantrum. When the child and the parent have a tantrum together, okay, this acting with is so much more manageable than suffering alone. And again, it reinforces the child's sense of omnipotence if they can make an adult tantrum to go out of their parenting zone and make mistakes, too much power for the child. These firm edge parents, they can get overwhelmed by the task of parenting, leading to inconsistent limit setting, sometimes doing this, sometimes doing that. So the three most common mistakes in limit setting, I refer to them as the three R's. The first reward, 
no, no, you can't have that second ice cream. No, no, one ice cream's enough. One, one, oh, okay, one more. Okay, rewarding. Reacting, we just talked about when the child has a tantrum and the adult gets triggered, they have a tantrum and they become dysregulated. They're no longer, longer modeling healthy behavior for their child. Remember, you're the exemplar. So as you respond to situations of stress and tension is how they learn to respond. And the final is to retreat. You set the limit, you say it again, you say it again. And right at that time when you should be saying the if then statement, you quietly go to your room and just let the child do whatever they want and kind of out of sight, out of mind attitude. So in closing, parents effectively set limits for children by clarifying values, and agreeing on rules and consequences. Communicating expectations and consequences clearly and consistently to the child. Providing verbal warnings, communicating limits when the child does not meet basic expectations. Communicating the final request, if, then. And once that final request is made, right, the action orientation of establishing consequences firmly and calmly. Four goes to five. And the final is linking the final limit violation with stated consequences and concluding the episode. When that three minute or five minute timeout or time in concludes, there is no talking. There's no reminding the child that they don't do this or that. It is over. That is the end of the episode. The parent does not restart in any way. The child's allowed to go out, function as if this never happened. And if there's another violation that comes up, it's treated just the same way. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of psychological explorations. Look forward to having you join us in the future.